Hello, everyone. This is your uh, friendly, humble neighbor, Carlos. <laughs> we are Restoration Fellowship, focus on thekingdom.org, and today I have a very special guest, Etienne Kernow, Kernow, sorry, in France. Uh, you are an English gentleman living in France, and you wrote uh, Etienne a paper we want to share with everyone today last year now on mm -hmm. the focus on the kingdom uh newsletter that goes out every month and by the way if you want to access those this is our web page uh home page you go down and then you'll see it here under magazine you click on magazine and you have all the issues there going back now 20 or so years we st started in anthony buzzard He's the editor, and he started it in the, uh, let's see, 90, what's the first issue there, 98. So going strong 20, 20 years next year, if my yep. math is correct. <laughs> I flunk math, folks. So, so Etienne, you wrote in a, a, a controversial, I guess I have to be honest here, because although I'm like-minded, we are like-minded, of course, mm -hmm. but this is a very touchy subject, to say the least, Etienne, the nonviolent subject. Now, first of all, before we get to it, you're going to talk about your article, Christian Nonviolence. Um, but first, Etienne, tell us a little bit about your previous life. Uh, you were an evangelical conservative Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what was your upbringing regarding this subject about nonviolence? Were you taught the good old just war theory or tell us about that? Mm. Well, I certainly wouldn't have had the, the strict nonviolent view that's expressed in that article. That's uh, a very recent development since I came out of the, the orthodox system. Uh, I suppose my notion would have been that if somebody starts attacking you, that you'd have a right to at least defend yourself. And in fact, um, I can give a re um, an anecdote along those lines where I heard a, um, an evangelical pastor say that uh, his understanding was if somebody comes along and strikes you on the cheek, um, the first reaction is to allow the, the assailant to strike you on the other cheek. And once they've done that, you're in the clear to take your jacket off and lay into them. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So you were, were you a, um, uh, military is okay kind of guy were you a very patriotic guy in terms of home and country take up arms uh, well my dad was a rank-and-file soldier in the British Army um, so I yes I would have been a patriot inclined to go and fight for my country if called upon mm -hmm. but now I would be a conscientious objector. Right. Uh, did you did you own weapons? Did your father have weapons at home? Uh, guns, no, rifles. That's an interesting question. Uh, as a child, I was never given a toy gun, and I think I know why. Because uh, my dad, as a trained soldier, would have had a very strict view about guns and he would have recognized that they're not toys mm. and so maybe he wouldn't have wanted to encourage me to look upon them as uh, a toy, toy. Oh, it's in, yeah it's interesting with uh, a lot of my father was military as well we, we never owned home, uh, guns mm. although we were of the world as they say we had no i mean i actually as an agnostic wanted to be in the military early on uh, right mm -hmm. out of high school i actually went to join but they actually rejected me on the basis that i needed a uh, work uh, history 
<laughs> right out of high school. <laughs> so that was interesting time. Mm -hmm. So back to you, Etienne. So um, you yourself later in your own adulthood, out of the home, you never thought about owning gu guns. And what did you think about those who did own guns? As you know, I'm, we're, I'm in the United States, by the way, Atlanta, Georgia, Etienne is in France. You grew up in England. Yeah. Uh, so very different cultures, as we know, the the American culture is very gun gun ho. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in fact, what I was going to say in answer yep. to your question, what did I think of people who own guns? I would have thought they were American. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, Britain, I guess, does have um, laws. Um, the, where citizens can have guns oh, yeah. at oh, home, yeah. of course, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Americans are always taught that, oh, we don't want to be like those Europeans, they take away your guns and, you know. <laughs> mm. No, you can have a gun if um, it's uh, strictly, um, <clears throat> there's strict laws about it. You have to undergo some kind of psychological test, I believe, and it's, usually if you're a member of a shooting club or something. Mm -hmm. Now, one very interesting thing of England, uh, you can correct me on this, the bobbies, is that the bobbies, the, the police officers. The police there, uh, for the longest time until recently, is this correct, they were not armed? Yes, that's right. When did that change over? Do you know? Uh, well, I've been out of the country for... <laughs> So it's in very recent years, I believe. Probably uh, post 9-11? Oh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Okay. And it's down, I gather it's down to the individual policemen whether they, they wish to be armed or not. Wow. Here it's, you know, it's mm. a requirement, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, advance the story for the folks out there. So you are a pretty much like most Christians, you have no issues, you're a home and country kind of guy. Mm -hmm. If you own guns at home, you're probably American and that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so how long did that position last in that, uh, that old Etienne? <laughs> when did that old Etienne die? <laughs> uh, probably within a year of leaving the evangelical system, by which time I was a uh, Unitarian and uh, starting to examine other doctrines. Um, so this was five years ago or so? Four? Yeah, I came out in 2013 so probably uh, we're talking about three or four years ago. So it's interesting uh, as you're coming out of other evangelical doctrines that you now believe are wrong, like the Trinity, eternal, uh, immortal soul, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. You also come to the understanding that we're supposed to be not home and country, not patriotic. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes, although I still have some some feeling for for my <laughs> my. Uh, English identity, um, not to the point of wanting to kill somebody else for it. Go to war mm. or, or support uh, military mm. interventions and so on. Mm. Because as Anthony points out, um, that's going to bring you into a situation where um, you're taking on a Christian on the other side. No? Right, that you might be killing other Christians. Yeah. And, um, you know, when in the Second World War, the Germans were saying, Gott mit uns, God with us. And oh, on okay. the other side, uh, we'd have been saying something similar. They can't both be right, can they? they they're probably both wrong. God is with neither. It, it's like the old joke about the two football teams. Uh, praying before the game, <laughs> you know, God give us victory to the mm -hmm. Nottingham team or the Liverpool team. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Etienne, so it's interesting. Um, did the gospel uh, about the kingdom um, ad advance that change in you? Do you believe that the idea that, uh, you know, the nations of this world will one day be uh, subjugated, some of them destroyed at the second coming, and that really you're, you're, we await the government of, of God's kingdom. Did that play any role in? in... I don't think so. In, in fact, my question um, in response to that would be, um, it's, there are still going to be identifiable nations in the kingdom over whom uh, Jesus and the Christians will rule. Mm -hmm. that, and um, each Christian is going to be allocated certain cities, certain areas to rule over. So does that mean that each Christian retains their original national identity? Mm. That's my question. Right. Will I still be, will I still have the English uh, identity and mentality in the kingdom? I would right. hope at least for that much. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a good question because, you know, uh, Paul talks about the Israel of God mm. and how we are, you know, the famous new, new condition of the olive tree in Romans and how people from all, na all nations, all creeds, not creeds, sorry, all nations will be inserted mm. into the olive tree, which is the new Israel, I guess. Mm. The Israel of God. So, yeah, I mean, that that's a good question um, for another, I guess, video. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's look at, um, uh, okay, so before we go to your paper, um, well, is there any one thing you can point to that sort of uh, either totally changed your view on this topic or got the ball starting? Got the ball rolling, I mean. <laughs> uh, I recall it being talked about once or twice in the Sunday Bible studies. Um, so one day I just sat down with a piece of paper um, and scribbled a few notes, and that turned into the, the article we're about to look at. I've lost you. Sorry. Uh, so that was one of our um, one of our sermons, or one of Anthony's in one yeah. of our services. Yeah. Well, he'd mention it from time to time because um, I think it's an area of particular interest for Anthony. <coughs> he'd written a paper on. Um, so he right. used to mention it from time to time. Right. That, that's right. He he wrote. Uh, by the way, if you want to see that paper. Um, Etienne is talking about it's on the same uh, website you go to the articles you click on here and it's all the way at the bottom um, it's funny that's almost at the uh, war and peace uh, so you've read this paper uh, Etienne yeah. towards the cessation of church suicide yeah I believe uh, uh, Anthony um, Theological upbringing was a stint he did with the uh, uh, Brethren, I think they're called. Uh, it's a pacifist uh, group, a uh, college. So, all right. So let's get to this interesting series of questions you proposed. Um, again, this is a topic, folks, anyone watching that, we are a minority within the minority. In other words, the Biblical Unitarian group, I would say is minority nonviolent, minority disposition. <clears throat> but historically, Etienne, and you probably know this, it was at first a majority position of Biblical Unitarians, of the mm. old Polish brethren. There's a famous story of the college there in uh, in Transylvania that um, survived for about a hundred years there, and 
and they, there was a, a colleges, biblical Unitarian colleges, and the students went around with wooden swords. Uh, the, the history tells us as a sign that, you know, they were totally. Uh, the first edict of Torda in the 16th century uh, was under the influence of biblical Unitarians, and that was the first ever toleration bill from a government, a head of state, which greatly influenced later the uh, constitution, the so-called separation of church and state here. Uh, Jefferson was a great admirer, as you probably know, Etienne, of mm -hmm. the Polish brethren, uh, Joseph uh, Priestley. Um, so, and all those boys were <laughs> nonviolence and, and uh, is there a, um, uh, th there's a definitional thing here too, Etienne. Can you tell us your definition? If there's any, is there any difference between a pacifist, pacifism, and what you hold, nonviolence, or is it the same? Um, it would be more active. Um, Jesus isn't, isn't telling us to freeze and do nothing. Uh, there, there is action that we can take, um, combat of a more spiritual nature. Uh, we're engaged in a spiritual battle. So that doesn't mean we're completely disarmed um, should we find ourselves in a situation where we are being physically assaulted. Um, it, I think it's a story you yourself told of um, a Christian who was attacked and they started praying out loud mm -hmm. and it completely disarmed the assailants. Mm. Is that so, right? Oh yeah, ma many stories like that and people can uh, Google them, many stories. So yeah, so pacifism is more of um, you do nothing. <clears throat> is that your view? And nonviolence, the sort of nonviolence we're trying to, mm. to uh, learn from the New Testament is what I would term, uh, it's not total non-resistance. Mm. Yeah, I'm just reminded of your mantra, um, pacifism isn't passivism double right. s and v right right so you, you agree with that sentiment yeah. as well yeah it's it's a militant pacifism but you don't do nothing you have mm. got some some weapons spiritual weapons um yeah there you go right <laughs> that, that's my bumper sticker if anyone <laughs> Uh, right, so so there's a big difference, and and this is one of the things I myself, Etienne, I don't know if you, I do not know if you agree, but there's a big misunderstanding because of pacifism mm -hmm. uh, for the last I don't know a hundred years maybe that it sort of skewed the view of what New Testament nonviolence mm -hmm. should, should be. Mm -hmm. And, and then I have a little tagline there, peace is active, stay calm and get creative. Mm. I call it a default button that we all human beings have. If I'm walking down the street or if I'm riding in my car, driving my car and I get hit either in my car or on my person, the default button is violence, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's my, my natural instinct is to retaliate in the same way, right? Yep. But as, as we'll see, the New Testament, it's, it's a total, that's why when I came to Christianity as an agnostic, it was a total brain switch. Like, the, the, it, you know, you think the world is, is uh, right side up, but it's actually upside down. And God sort of says, no, it's upside down. This is right side up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that, that's the interesting thing. Okay. Well, I'm glad we agree. I didn't know if, if you agreed with the difference there. <clears throat> all right, let, let's go to your paper here. So you have, uh, now this is all question, and I love this paper because of the nature of it, the, the way you did it. 
you have questions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all we, we're seeking to stimulate people there. We, we don't do these teachings and videos to debate for debate for the sake of debate, but to stimulate your thinking, right? So tell us, uh, I'll be asking your questions to you. Is it acceptable to resort to violence in self-defense? And you say, Jesus says no. Yes, well, we immediately go to the Sermon on the Mount to see what Jesus has to say in answer to that. Right, so we have there, you have Matthew 5, 39. Tell mm -hmm. us about that, how you understand this. He says, but I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him as well. Now, that's, that's interesting. I'd never noticed that before because someone... Um, some disingenuous type might say, well, if he hits me on the, the left cheek first, is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good question. <laughs> right. But obviously Jesus is, um, he's not countenancing uh, any kind of retaliation there, is he? Right, and it's not about, it's the left or the right cheek, I mm. think. It's just a broader point you think he's yeah. making. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't want, need to repeat himself by um, coming right. at it from the other angle. <laughs> um, what do you make of the saying there, offer no resistance? That sounds like total non-resistance. Yeah, that's an interesting point because we are in a spiritual battle and we're supposed to be res resisting the devil. Mm -hmm. But it says, offer no resistance to one who, is evil. one who is evil. Is that describing the assailant or the devil behind him who might be encouraging that mm -hmm. individual to attack you? Because uh, mm -hmm. the devil's evil, but we are to resist him, it says in other texts. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Right, and, and you also remind me of what Paul says in Ephesians about we don't, we're, we're not battling flesh and blood. Mm. but the things behind that yeah the, the evil intents behind that mm. okay so let's see the other text he used was first peter 2:23 yes this is uh peter commenting <coughs> on um jesus's general demeanor when he was insulted he returned no insult when he suffered, he did not threaten. Instead, he handed himself over to the one who judges justly. So in other words, it's a, it's a test of our trust in God if we should find ourselves in this kind of situation where we're being abused, insulted, threatened, <coughs> intimidated, etc. Um, are you going to react in a carnal way? Or, or are we going to trust in God and commit the, the situation to him? Yeah, so it's back to the story of, of the people praying in times of uh, personal attacks, mm. maybe. Okay, and the next one, we go back to Matthew and Etienne. Tell us about that one. Oh, uh, Yes. As I recall, um, Matthew was speaking to Peter? Yeah, Peter. Mm -hmm. The context is Peter, and this is at the garden when they're coming to arrest him. Yeah. Um, and at that stage, had he actually chopped... Um, chopped the guy's ear off? Mm. Let's see. We can go to the context here. It's always good. Um, let's see. Uh, friend, then Jesus, uh, hold on, stepping forward, uh, verse 50 there, they laid hands on Jesus, arrested. Behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Okay, it doesn't 
identify him as Peter here. Maybe Luke does. Mm -hmm. Just says that one of those who accompanied Jesus. Yeah, it sounds a lot like the sort of thing Peter might have done. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the other gospel identifies him as Peter. Yeah, but that gives us the context of mm -hmm. Jesus' exhortation there. Um, you you want to you want to read the rest for the audience there, starting at, uh, at verse, verse fifty one and all the way to fifty six. Yep. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its teeth, and all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call upon my father, and he will not provide me at this moment, with more than 12 legions of angels. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must come to pass in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as a, against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day, I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. <laughs> Dear, and we're worried about being left alone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it sounds like the context here is all about the Messianic prophecies as well. The fact that he's found with... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, oh yeah, it had to happen. Uh, hmm. It was yeah, it was to fulfill prophecy, wasn't it? Yeah, I think uh, Luke in the Luke account uh, gives us uh, more information about that. Uh, so yeah, so back to the. Um, so you had here, failure to comply carries its own perfectly proportioned penal, uh, punishment. What, what did you mean by that in, in that verse 52 there? Well, we'd have to go there and see. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, that's the perfectly proportioned punishment. Um, if you want to take up the sword to kill somebody, this the same thing is likely to happen to you. Simple as that. Right. Live, live by the sword, die by the sword. Huh? Okay. And then you used uh, Luke uh, 19.27. Uh, why did you use that one? Um, what was the question? Leading into that, uh, the same one uh, is it accept acceptable to resort to violence in self defense? Sorry, I have to go back here. So, you have that text there. Now, as for those enemies of mine who did not want me as their king, bring them here and slay them before me. Uh, let's see, you said the ultimate death penalty awaits all who make themselves oh, enemies yes. of Jesus by refusing to abide by his nonviolent code of conduct. Yes, so if you've, if you've resisted the, the nonviolent <coughs> preaching of Jesus, um, it would seem to indicate that you're not following him. And if you're not following him, then this is the ultimate... Um, fate of those who who refuse to to have him as their king right and you're of course now hitting on the now here um the issue of obedience uh to the son uh, mm. one of one of anthony buzzard's uh go-to texts is uh is it hebrews 5 9 yeah uh, let's see uh Yep, this is it. So 
now you're hitting on obedience. When he yep. was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So the obverse, the implication, is that if you don't obey him, mm -hmm. you don't have this eternal mm. salvation. Mm. Mm. Uh, it, it strikes me the more the more I thought about this whole topic that uh, it's a vital point of obedience to to Jesus like the rest right so you yeah so you're com what they call convicted mm. <laughs> that this is an is this is as is as essential yeah. as the other things uh, trinity immortal soul because this all has to do simply put with obedience to the teachings plural of yes Jesus. is that what you're saying yes yeah okay it's because if if you fail to obey in one aspect you know it's uh it's it um you haven't obeyed at all it's like the little hole which sinks an entire ship mm. right yeah the, there are many parts to uh, you, you talked earlier in another video with it about as an evangelical conservative mm. uh as a calvinist you were a calvinist too at one point yeah. uh, the focus is on the person i think you said of the person jesus. and work of jesus that's right, not the, not the, the teachings. Yeah, that's the heading you find in so many of their theological textbooks: the person and work of Christ. Where's right. the teaching? Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's all about what have you done for me lately, <laughs> mm. and not about what have you taught me lately. Mm. So, what you, yeah, what, go what ahead. did Jesus do? Mm -hmm. um, and what was his identity, as they suppose it to be? Nothing about what he preached, what he taught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't come into it. Right. And, and it's interesting because when it comes to this topic, Etienne, even the Muslims mm -hmm. admit, have to admit that Jesus was a nonviolent, mm -hmm. uh, enemy-loving uh, individual. I mean, the over here in the USA, you're in France once again, in Europe, you know, we've had this hippie Jesus for the longest time in Hollywood, right? The hippie Jesus, the long hair, the almost feminine Jesus, mm -hmm. because the New Testament is very clear that he was a love your enemy, mm -hmm. uh, go to everyone, touch the leper, uh, fellowship with the so-called... Um, sinners uh, fellowship with adulterers fellowship with anyone who's willing to listen to me uh so yeah it, it's an odd thing if it okay if it's about the person well let's look at the person of jesus that he was clearly not for violence mm. yet, yet it's still blind to that the system yes <laughs> yes all right we'll go enough we'll, said enough said we'll go to your next question was is it permissible to defend another with violence mm. well that's what uh peter was wanting to do um when the <coughs> uh, malthus uh, turned up wasn't it right and uh, we've already seen what Jesus had to say about that. Right, and the text uh, you have here is John 18 and Matthew 26. So let's go to John 18, 10. Tell us about that one. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, we've already been there. So uh, mm. that just reiterates the point, doesn't it? Uh, not only can we uh, not defend ourselves... Uh, we're not even to, and this is a more difficult side to it. We cannot intervene to defend somebody else who's been attacked. Um, so that would mean, say, say I see an elderly lady being attacked in the street. My first um, instinct would be to want to step in and help her. Uh, 
but it looks like all we can do is appeal to the authority mm. um, who has from God the right to use violence in that kind of situation to um, to enforce law and order. Mm. Now, we cannot act as the law enforcer in that situation. Uh, what about those who believe there are many nonviolent Christians, like-minded, who believe in restraint, trying to restrain the the, mm -hmm. the uh, evil person. Well, would mm -hmm. you be for that? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, according to the 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 law of the land, if you lay a finger on somebody, that's assault. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, well, here over Where here, the. the where do you draw the line? Where does restraint end and the sort begin? Once you, you know, laid a finger on somebody. Over here across the uh, pond, as they say, uh, there's a thing called citizen's arrest. I don't know if that's the same. Oh, yes, yes. Funeral. yes so yes. there are situations that the law has to uh, yeah, give, good point. Good you know. Point. Yeah. Uh, because Anthony always talks about, uh, let's say, the suicidal person person is oh. about to commit suicide or cause harm to themselves or others. Oh, yeah, well, that's not an assault, is it? Exactly right. So may maybe there is room for, for that. So, And that is an act of love to preserve the life of that individual. Mm -hmm. Which is funny. You just hit on the uh, an act of love. Augustine, who is the father of the uh, just so-called just war, um, said things like it's loving to kill your enemy because it's loving because you stop them from condemning themselves all the more by causing more evil and you're obviously saving innocence what do you make of Augustine's uh, you know well, it's loving to kill basically oh, so what he's saying there is that a lesser evil can be justified to cover a potential greater evil. It's evil right. is evil. Right, the, the so-called lesser of two evils you're, you're talking about? Yeah, it's an evil. A lesser evil's an evil. Yeah, you know, we, we just had an election, you probably heard. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, people kept saying, evangelicals kept saying look we have to vote for the lesser of two evils <laughs> right so all right and you also use the following verse here so the question once again was uh just to bring it back is it permissible to defend another with violence are we allowed and tell us about this section here um, well, that's the same episode. Isn't it? Is there any additional information from this version of it? Um, you want to read it for us? Yeah. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Right, pretty clear. Yep. Okay, let's move on to, are there any exceptional circumstances where violent resistance is allowed? I think we're... Yeah. Pretty much. Yes, well, it's, yeah, it, that takes us back to the point we were just making, doesn't it? From mm -hmm. 1 Peter 3 9. Right. First uh, uh, Peter, where is it? 3 9. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult. <coughs> On the contrary, a blessing. Because to this you are called that you might inherit a blessing. In other words, we're not to deal with uh, assailants 
with the same currency that they that they deal in because as christians we've been issued with a uh, a spiritual currency um, and so we can repay in a different way um, with a blessing that's spiritual money that is hmm. I always understood that last part there that you might inherit a blessing um, with the kingdom am I right to do that yeah yeah and it's the kingdom hope which um which can give you the uh, the motivation and the self control to react in the, in this uh, this contrary way, right? This nonviolent way. Yeah. <clears throat> so the the whole of the Christian hope seems to be based on living out a life of not returning evil for evil, mm. not insulting. On the con on the contrary you were called to do the opposite I mean uh, yeah and having received Holy Spirit we've got our pockets full of a, a different currency mm. we're rich in Christ right and you're talking now the Ephesians uh, is that what you're referring to mm. Ephesians 1 the uh, uh, the what's it call it there uh, a redemption inheritance through the spirit is that it uh yeah the well, i forgot the name oh, okay here we go in him you also who have heard the word of truth the gospel of your service have believed in him were sealed with the promise uh holy spirit yeah and it first, goes on it yeah. goes on go go with, ahead, go ahead first, read, read that section. the first installment First down payment, first spiritual currency. Why do we need that spiritual currency so that we don't, we've got something to repay evil with in a currency other than evil? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good footnote there by the NABRE. Uh, down payment by God yeah. on full salvation. So this is yeah. the first installment payment yeah this is spiritual currency and we need it for certain situations mm. otherwise we're going to react like anybody else and then what happens we look and act like the world in yeah. this case right mm. and yeah. we don't we don't want to do that mm. because our citizenship comes from heaven as paul says in philippians Let's move ahead here. So what the, what do we do, Etienne? Without reading your excellent commentary here, see if you on the fly can help us here. So what what is this nice? I want to be a good Christian. Yes, I want to obey. I get you obey Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. So help us. Yeah, well, before, before we tackle that one, I'd just like to say that... Um, in such an extreme situation, I'm not sure how I would react because that first instinct to strike back is still nevertheless present oh. and has to be fought and overcome. That'll I don't know what, what if somebody suddenly breaks in through that door behind me? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I... What, <laughs> um, mm. um, but... I'm bringing out what scripture tells us we ought to do in that situation, mm -hmm. um, hoping that should it happen, um, um, up to the standard. But I have to put that question mark against me, knowing <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that certain natural instincts haven't been entirely uh, washed away. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, you remind me of what John says in the first letter. Who, if a Christian says they have no sin, the, they're a liar. So it's not, you know, we're not perfect. We don't go on to not commit any sins <laughs> as a Christian. No, we will fail. We will disobey at times. We're human. We're not Jesus yet. <clears throat> Tell us about the verse here you used, uh, 1 Peter 2.23, if you want to read that for us. 
Um, when he was insulted, he returned no insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Instead, he handed himself over to the one who judges justly. One, not three, Etienne. <laughs> To the one. Did I say something else? No, no. The, um, uh, it was a Trinity joke. To the one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, great shit. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we have this, this person <laughs> who committed no insult. He returned no insult. Instead, mm -hmm. he suffered. He did not threaten and instead he handed himself. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded, uh, Anthony reminds me of a good verse, I forget uh, the chapter in Romans, uh, where I think he quotes Old Testament and says, we, we are sheep, we, we go like sheep to the slaughter mm. um, in this world, we're, we're handed over. So, yeah. Yeah, it's as if the expectation or the default position is that we're <laughs> we're there to be chopped down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's something that you've said yourself in in certain studies that uh, the early Christians had that martyr spirit. Yeah, they considered it as perfectly normal that they might actually be be killed for their faith and maybe the fact that we've lost that in mm. subsequent centuries mean that we uh, Christianity has, has tended to normalize the the reactions that ordinary worldly people would consider appropriate in those situations mm. and we need to get back to that mentality of those early Christians yeah and so what can we do uh well this verse is also about prayer right yeah uh, you hand yourself to the one mm. you, you trust in the one and by yeah. the one is the one god not the three god <laughs> um <clears throat> so prayer is a is a very fundamental thing here mm. when when the when it goes down as they say yeah. Uh, so let's advance here a little bit. So that's one thing we can do. What about you have, what else can we do? Violent law enforcement. And you cite there, let's go to the Romans one. So what can we do then? And in Romans one here, you want to read uh, that first section there, of Romans? Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been established by God therefore whoever resists authority opposes what God has appointed and those who oppose it will bring judgment upon themselves for rulers are not a cause of fear to good conduct but to evil do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval from it. For it is a servant of God for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword without purpose. It is the servant of God to inflict wrath on the evildoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be subject not only because of the wrath but also because of conscience this is why you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of god devoting themselves to this very thing pay to all their dues taxes to whom taxes are due toll to whom toll is due respect to whom respect is due honor to whom honor is due. So, so what can you tell us about this in uh, terms of what we can do then? Isn't this all about um, trusting the authorities or handing the, um, the responsibility for dealing with 
violent incidents to the authority. Can you remind me what the question was? Yeah, what, what can we do then? Uh, so we appeal to prayer on the basis of First Peter 2.23, the one who judges. And mm -hmm. then you can also appeal, I guess, to the authorities. Oh, yeah. Which in a way, it goes it's back to God, to Paul yes. says, because yes. God establishes the authority. Uh, yeah, it's appealing to uh, God's delegated authority. That's effectively appealing ultimately to God, isn't it? Yeah, so, because if, if we follow the chain of command, there's sort yeah. of a chain of command here. Yeah. So you've got God who's always overall. And then Paul saying, well, guess what? God establishes the, the authorities, as, as evil as they might be, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, another, that's another question, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, you know what's amazing in this passage to me is Paul is living in one of the most, you know, vile uh, governments that mm. there has been, the, the Greco-Roman world of the emperors. You know, the emperors were not nice. <laughs> they were very awful people. Yet, uh, he still uh, talks about them in a positive light in terms of, well, at the end of the day, they keep the order, don't they? Yeah, yeah. That, that brings us to a broader question. Um, and it's something I have a struggle with. When you see the kind of people who of being elected to political office um, and you can see certain corruption there and yet God commands us to respect those people on what basis should we respect them when we see certain evidence that uh, their their character is uh, rather flawed to put it mildly mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest we're to respect them not because of what they might be, good or bad, but because of the function that they occupy mm. and the fact that it's God who's placed them there. So respect God's decision and uh, abide by it. And mm. respect that, that uh, person's dignified office and try to put to one side uh, the, the type of character they might be. Mm. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, that's a very legitimate question. Uh, someone could have asked Jesus when he said, you know, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. Mm -hmm. Pay your taxes, basically. So I that, that was a very good time to say to Jesus, wait a minute, Jesus, the emperor is a immoral, you know, evil, pagan, Ruler, well, what are you on about? Render to Caesar. I don't want to render anything to Caesar. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a zealous Jew. Um, but the simple fact is, uh, why should we? Because Jesus says so. Mm -hmm. Because his delegated apostles say so to do. Now, obviously, in, in our recent history, um, we had a very evil government the Nazi German party, the national German party. Uh, what would you say to the counter argument to this line that appealed to the authorities? Well, what if the authorities are exterminating whole races of human beings? Well, should I respect those authorities? Well, Paul's exhortation was made in the context of um, the authority being um, a Roman persecutor putting Christians to death. Mm. And yet, <laughs> we have this exhortation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very difficult, but... Mm. Um, you also talk about in your paper, Etienne, about uh, then Christians, many Christians say to themselves, well then on the basis of what Paul is saying here, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to become a politician, I'm going to join the military in order to have some Christ, Christian influence there. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you say to that? Uh, I would say it's not our business. 
um, that we're training to be part of a, a future government which is going to put this world right and that quite frankly um, <laughs> we have no hope I see no hope in the, the governments of this world um, in any of their attempts to put the world right. They're destined to fail. Some will do better than others. Some will do incredibly badly. But uh, ultimately, we should be focusing our attention on preparing for future rule rather than get, getting tangled up in uh, the world's politics now. Leave them to it. Right, and and you uh, reference Philippians three twenty. Uh, do you want to read the context here in the passage mm -hmm. from seventeen? There, Philippians three. Join with others in being imitators of me, brothers, and observe those who thus conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. For many as I have often told you and now tell you even in tears, conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. That doesn't mean uh, that's where we're going. Uh, and from it, we also await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. Right, so it's in heaven, but mm. it's coming. Yeah. It's from it, right? So what do you gather from this in terms of joining the, as he said, the nations of this world in a political or military function? Well, uh, we don't qualify because you have to be the national of a kingdom to be involved in, as a political governor of it. And our citizenship is not in any of the... <laughs> the national go governments of this this world we're disqualified by the fact that our nationality is elsewhere mm -hmm. i don't right. know if i've explained that very well but no i, I think it's it's right the uh, as anthony puts it he's a well he's a green card holder he's a united states green card holder but he's also a green card we are green card holders of this present evil age. Oh, yeah. Our true citizenship mm. is in heaven, and from it, at his second coming, I think that's what Paul's saying here in Philippians 3. As throughout, the second coming is all about Christ coming to us and not us going to Christ <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and living in heaven in disembodied spirits but him coming and transforming our bodies actually that's what that's what paul says here in philippians 3. so yeah we have a we have a nationality that is not of this world hmm. uh, i think that's what jesus says to Pilate, didn't he he says uh my my kingdom is not it doesn't originate from here it's not of this world. Right. He, he put it in those terms. Mm. In John 18, uh, 36, right? Yeah. Right. So let's, let's see. Let's uh, end here your paper. So conclusion, you, you want to just give us your conclusion as to this topic here? as we wrap it up it just you know from from your opinion what would you say to those uh struggling with this topic 
read the scriptures and think again. <laughs> right. Think about obedience to Jesus, whom you claim to follow. Mm -hmm. Right, and let's end it then with more scripture, uh, Etienne. If you don't mind reading uh, for us, let's read from Paul here. The, this is a scripture I was alluding to in Romans 8. You, you want to start there in verse 31? What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not give, also give us everything else along with him? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who acquits us. Who will condemn? It is Christ who died, rather was raised, who also is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being slain all the day. We are looked upon as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That is an incredible passage, isn't it? So it's about that spirit of martyrdom, martyrdom, right? Yes, sometimes we will get smashed. We will, we will get destroyed, folks. Yes, sometimes not just us, but loved ones will be destroyed. Sometimes we will see them perish before we ourselves perish. That is an awful situation, yes, of course. But look at the hope. Look mm. at the trust this man had, Paul. Look at the trust the Son of God himself had, right? He saw, he says, the glory ahead and gladly took it. He took the lashings, folks. He took the torture. This man went, you know, he, he poured out himself, says the suffering servant. Uh, passages of Isaiah, right? But what was, we have to look ahead. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the passage also in Hebrews 11, uh, Etienne, about, it talks about the, the people of faith, right? It goes through the list. And it talks about Abraham, the father of the faith. And it says that he was willing to kill his only son. Why? Well, obviously because God told him to, but because he reckoned that God could bring him back from the dead. You remember that passage there? Yeah, yeah. This, that, that's what it's all about, folks. It's about the resurrection hope. It's about the kingdom hope. It's all the same thing. They're, they're, they're names for the same uh, event. Uh, so, yes, don't be scared. Uh, it, it it's not easy, right? Although Jesus says, "Take my yoke," it's easy. <laughs> well, thanks Jesus, but yeah. you know, it's it. What's easy is the the hope we have. That that's what's easy. That God, in His mercy, in His incredible patience, from all the awful things we do, all the awful lives we live, He says, "Look, I'll give you a, a chance." And not just one. Okay, look. All right, you messed up. Okay, here's another chance. <laughs> and he's still giving all of us a chance, folks. God wants everyone to be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, any any last words for our audience out there, Tian? From your personal experience, I appreciate you. And because, uh, you know, what you bring to the table is incredible as a former Calvinist, as a former entrenched evangelical <laughs> conservative. 
So any any last words for the people out there on this particular topic? Uh, I think we've <laughs> we've covered all the bases. I think mm -hmm. we've raised the principal aspects. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, I just I just send people to the scriptures to see um, what strikes me as being entirely evident um, that in terms of physical violence, our um, our hands are tied by obedience to to Jesus, but then they're released by um, his spirit to combat in another way, in a spiritual way. Mm. Well, well said. I'll just end it there. I can't end it any better. Uh, thank you, Etienne. Uh, I know it's, it's getting late there in France. Uh, it's getting uh, noon uh, at this time in Atlanta, but we thank you. Uh, we thank you. we appreciate you in in our Sunday meetings, and once again, folks, uh, please uh, go and have a look at this uh, paper by our brother Etienne, Christian Nonviolence. Think about it. Look at it as a challenge. Uh, we're here to persuade, not to force anyone into anything. Uh, this is Focus on the Kingdom magazine, editor Anthony Buzzard, August 2016 uh, issue. Thank you, and we'll see you down the road. Thank you, Etienne. Bye, Carlos.